Hello, everybody. I'm Michael Smith. Welcome to The Lowdown. Today, joining me is Kevin Lennox. Kevin, welcome to the show. I feel like uh, in one month's time, about a year's worth of just stuff has happened. And I thought we would uh, definitely kick off. We got a lot to talk about, but I thought we'd just kick off on the geopolitical front. We all know what's happened yeah. here uh, with Hamas and everything, but I thought we'd get your take and, uh, and what, what your thoughts are on the geopolitical issues that we have. We don't know. <laughs> True. How this, what it, it is, you know, certainly has more of our attention than other geopolitical risk flares in the past. True. We are one miscalculation away from a much broader war with unknown consequences. So this kind of brings back to you know, something you and I talk about a lot is the importance of having a financial plan. And in this sort of a geopolitical backdrop, you know, are you age 30 or 40 just starting out? Mm -hmm. Or are you 70, where a short-term drop would hurt you potentially much more? And that's why we really focus so much more on doing a financial plan. And one thing I like to do is stress test that plan. Okay. So let's just say we have you know, some miscalculation and the market is down 30%. Would that change your life? For some it would drastically, yeah. for some it would not. So stress testing a financial plan and saying, okay, well, how much risk can you take? I think goes a long way to reducing the anxiety when every term you turn on the news or you look at social media, there's a scary headline, which are designed that way to generate clicks and attention. Yeah. So hopefully cooler heads prevail, but I think the best thing you can do is just go through the financial plan before something escalates rather than reacting emotionally afterwards. And so basically knowing those risk levels that you can handle uh, beforehand and then knowing that your financial plan is going to get you through. I mean, look, I know all of our clients that have financial plans. The one thing they know is when all these, you know, that all the noise pops up, this drowns out the noise. And it's the only thing right. out there that we can offer anybody that really just drowns out the noise, knowing what your hand, your financial plan can handle. And then you can sit quietly or at least to some degree through right. most of the stuff out right. there. So yeah. that's what you're trying to say. Basically. And, and a big thing we're doing is working on expenses. You know, you actual expenses are higher than what the CPI reports show. True. So we go through the financial plan and we are updating the numbers and they're coming in a lot higher <laughs> than we thought. So some of these score, you know, financial scores are, are changing. Sure. But there's added comfort then going through that process and then saying, okay, what if we then have a drop in assets as well from the market? How does that really change your life? And it just lowers the temperature in the room considerably when you have all these types of you know, headlines going on. Well, you know, we got a lot going on right now. One, we got multiple wars happening, uh, the beginning of a new trade war with China, <laughs> the least affordable housing market that we've seen. And uh, of course now oil back above 90, so we're gonna get into that in a minute, but having a financial plan is a necessity now. If you don't have one, I don't know what exactly it is you're waiting for, but this is the time to have it because I've, and I think you agree, volatility is probably gonna be more, you know, more frequent in the coming decade than we've, what we've seen in the past. I just think there's so many things that are happening, end of cycle, long-term cycle ending, the social economic cycle. I mean, so much is happening. It is time to have a plan to help you make those good investment-based decisions. Yeah, the, the era of low interest rates, low inflation, I, I think is in the rearview mirror. Agreed. So with a normalization of interest rates and you know, occasional spikes in energy prices, then expect to see more volatility. Well, speaking of geopolitical, obviously this one, I think I agree with you, this one has teeth. We don't know exactly how much yet. So this is something that's going to be a concern, I think, for a, a long time. Um, but let's tie that back to oil. I know that oil is a, a topic you like to talk about. How does this affect? You got many, many different factors now with this whole situation. Many people talking about oil being higher uh, for a long period of time. But what are your thoughts on where oil is and where oil is going? Such, such an emotional asset class. <laughs> yes, you look at price patterns of oil mm -hmm. and energy, and it's a V shape. You know, there's no, what do they call them? There's no Com steady Eddie. handle or <laughs> yeah. long-term bases where you're looking at a breakout. Yeah. It's V-shaped. And, you know, you, you have the anti-energy, you know, sentiment. Oh, for sure. You have the carbon climate activists and you have well-timed headlines that can push oil in either direction. So we, we've talked about this starvation of CapEx 
the supply shortage, and then Saudi Arabia cuts their exports by a million and a half barrels a day. And now we've got OECD inventories at the lowest level in decades. Yeah. There's not spare capacity. No. You know, previously when we had an oil shock in the Middle East, there was spare capacity. Now there's not. And by so, the way, the process of getting oil online isn't a click of a finger. It's a process. Exactly. So, um, you know, we look at, you know, what's been done so far when energy has gone higher. So we had the SPR release, a Strategic mm -hmm. Petroleum Reserve. Then we very quietly allowed Iran to ship more oil than the sanctions would otherwise allow. Yeah. And then just what broke this week was relaxation of sanctions on Venezuela, allow them to export more oil if they promise to hold free and fair elections. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> okay. So on top of that, then we also had uh, a story about the collapse in gasoline demand directly tied to destruction of demand from high prices, which caused a huge out of selling. But what that actually was, was the, the way that was measured is delivery from refineries okay. of gasoline to the end user. Well, we had terrible storms in the Southwest in early September. Remember all those people in the mud at the Burning Man? Yes, <laughs> yes. yeah, I do, I know some people that were there. <laughs> so, and then you had very heavy flooding in the Northeast as well, just a week or two later. Yeah. So there were disruptions there that I think played into that quite a bit. I don't see really that demand fell off a cliff suddenly, but it made for headlines. Mm -hmm. And so we'll probably see a, a reversal uh, in that. But just over the last week, we had, I think, 148 million barrels uh, in the futures and options contract across the energy complex within a week. That was huge. And within three weeks, I think it was 300 and something million barrels, which unwinds about half of everything that built up since the end of June through September, which was a big run in, in energy. So you have you know, well-planted stories, you have emotion and, you know, big swings on both sides is great for traders. Yeah. It's still a very, very tight market. And I think directionally, the easier pathway for oil is higher. Well, and so that seems to be the big narrative. Now, let me ask you this, the, the one counter to that is the slowdown in China. And obviously China is a big demand for energy. Do you, where do you sit on that part? I think China is stronger economically overall. Mm -hmm than U.S. headlines would suggest. Year on year, demand for, or actually, imports of, of oil, 15% ahead of last year. They have problem, real problems in the real estate side. Absolutely. The industrial side's doing quite well. Okay. There is growth in China, but it makes good while well, we've got all these you know, anti-China policies and containment policies. Well, industrial needs energy. To talk about weakness in China <laughs> and try to capitalize on that. Yeah. But they're they're importing a lot of oil. They have, and they're they're building on thousands of miles of road each day. So I think not as not as weak as implied. Okay. Well, I, I agree with that. And so, and, uh, now, what about is there any specific company in regards uh, to energy you want to maybe talk about? Anything that's going on there, specific wise? So the big name over the past week is the Exxon acquisition of, of Pioneer. Okay. Fifty nine and a half billion dollar all stock deal. It's a big one. And so this really expands Exxon's footprint in the Permian. So now they're one of the big three in there. A lot of synergies. Um, I think they talked about $2, two billion worth of synergy um, starting next year per year for the next decade. Okay. So, that's, so it's, it, it's focusing resources in the Permian, okay. um, but also increases their short cycle uh, production from 28% to 40%, which allows them to better manage production in a changing price environment. So oh. it looks like a good bolt-on acquisition yeah. of a high quality company with resources that are very complementary to Exxon. Well, especially in time that you know supply is gonna be tight and we're gonna need more supply to get online. So better, better to have uh, the efficiencies of Exxon and, and, and team in there getting that online. 
So that's so that's that's cool. Well, that's reassuring. It might be one of the only few things out there that's reassuring, Kevin. A uh, lot's definitely happened. Well, let's uh, well let's let's kind of maybe switch gears. Um, you know, let's get into maybe earnings right now. We've had a lot of earnings. I know if you look at the market in general, it, you know, if and you and I have talked about this. If you take out seven stocks, I think the market's probably up four percent a year. If you add those seven, the market's somewhere up around fourteen. The S and P at least. Right. So you know, definitely uh, the the breadth of this market is very narrow uh, mm -hmm. to seven stocks. But how is that? looking on the earnings front, what do you see in there? So we're just starting the Q3 prints okay. as the big banks. Uh, surprise, J, JPM, JP Morgan just came out and blew it out of the water. Okay. Um, but the interesting is that they decreased their reserves for losses. Everybody increased them in, after the first quarter. So they decreased them. Jamie Dimon, you know, has historically, not historically, many times, you know, gave him a more has given a more downbeat forecast for the sure. economy. Yeah, and he did again. But if you look at their earnings report, it was quite good. <laughs> and and Bank of America came out and and, and they beat on on their metrics uh, despite all the focus on you know you know held for maturity treasuries, which have been weighing on the stock. But what's interesting is that they, they both talk, and there's so much focus at, really at the exclusion of other data. They look to those big three companies, B of A, Wells, and, and J.P. Morgan, mm -hmm. say, how's the consumer doing? And they do have a ton of assets. But when you look at, for example, their, their credit card, the average credit score across those three companies is about 780. That's not an average credit score. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they have really moved upstream with their credit profile. It's much different if you look at Capital One or Ally Bank. <laughs> so the market is really looking at those headlines and just those really top companies and say, well, the consumer is still resilient. So it's like the seven stocks in the S and P doing the best. Now, banking is the big. The big companies are doing well. We know that's not the case for the smaller firms. I mean, how are the smaller banks looking and, and how is that? We were in a, in a state of emergency at the beginning of the year with a potential <laughs> bank failure. Uh, but what are we seeing now? How is that looking? So they're, they're still deposit flight. Mm -hmm. Again, if you own a small business and you carry well above the FDIC limits, how comfortable are you keeping your money at that small bank? You're not. Bank? And they also, the small to mid-sized banks also have about 70% of all the commercial real estate loans. Ouch. So that's that's a pain point, and they are trying to divest where they can. So a big divergence in, I think, earnings potential between the mega banks and, and the small banks. Well, Which parallels what we've been saying all exactly. year about, you know, preference for large companies, the S&P up 14, 15% on the year, mm -hmm. and the Russell 2000 small cap index, barely positive. Yep. That seems to be the case. And uh, well, to, so today we got, um, you talked about the state of consumer. So I thought staying on that for a minute, we had retail sales fell 0.7 over the last year. That's the 11th consecutive year over year decline. So that's not a good thing. Mm -hmm. Here we are, and you mentioned uh, the credit cards or the consumer's credit. The average credit card rate right now for the consumer is 22 and a half percent. We've seen now, we, we know that many consumers have been financing the price increases from inflation. How sustainable is this? We're now getting into one of the most important months. Uh, it's going to be, you know, coming November with Black Friday and all the shopping retail. This is going to be important. But how do you see the the consumer stay, the staying power of the consumer at this point? Well, it's been that you know we, we talked about the resiliency of the consumer. You know, the, and, the, mm -hmm. and the top ten percent in income and wealth are forget really that. Just, yeah, yeah, just, yeah. Just fine, but yeah. it's a dominant part of, of, of it is. spending. And you know, the the other part of this really, and it's not talked about very much really, is Government deficit is six percent of spending deficit is six percent of GDP. That's huge. I know. That's not sustainable, but it has flooded the economy with stimulus that has you know had a big impact. It's broad based. You know, fiscal stimulus means a whole lot more to the economy than a rate cut or QE. So that's really holding things up, but Every month, I mean, you can just, I, I see it just anecdotally in the, the data look at, small leverage businesses starting to file bankruptcy, starting to, to lay off the, you know, the, the, the lower income households really straining here. So debt's becoming an issue. And it's, and, and, and this is 
this is what happens if you if we're going to have rates higher for longer because inflation is going to stay higher for longer, structurally higher, then more and more it's going to just move upstream, and then it's going to hit I think investment grade corporate and, and high yield probably next year. You hear about the, this wall of maturities. Yes. Which yes. Is so so during COVID, companies and were very smart. Yeah. They, they, they refied their debt, they extended the maturity. So a lot of that is 2025, 2026, but that, that's not where companies are gonna have to refi. You have to refi a year in advance yeah. because otherwise that becomes a current liability, which throws off your liquidity and debt metrics and, and all of that. So next year, we're really gonna start to see it. But the, the leveraged loan market, which nobody really talks mm -hmm. about, is almost the same size as the high yield market. These are weaker companies though, and it's grown very rapidly, and there's, it's not really regulated. And JP Morgan just won a, a, a suit recently. They're not securities. Well, you know, it seems to be the theme, you know, the bigger, too big to fail are fine. But the smaller uh, companies, I mean, the smaller banks, everything else, same thing. So this debt repricing that you're mentioning, and you know, again, they have what on average three and a half percent debt. That you're going to start to see, and I got a chart here. It shows that even the smaller cap, this, the Russell 2000, the the monstrous amount of debt repricing they're going to have to do starting next year. So that's from three and a half, and they're going to be repricing at nine percent. Here at times where things are starting to deteriorate, this is not good. All these things are converging at at the wrong time. So that's going to be look. It's going to look pretty awful. That, that, that's the way cycles work. But you know, again, really, this you know flood of fiscal stimulus, which which is not sustainable, no. maybe part of the the rise we've had in interest rates. You yeah. Know, you look at the five year and the ten year and the thirty year now is about to five percent. Well, you know, why don't we kind of wrap this into to the Fed? I mean, because obviously now, I mean, the two percent target of inflation, we know that's the holy grail of what they want. That's pretty much a joke. You strip out. The shelter, you know, we, we probably are at that two percent. That's been the one, the one driving factor for about uh, for the core CPI. About seventy percent of it's been the shelter component, right? Um, but you know, looking at the Fed and what they're going to do, the bond market has done so much tightening in addition to the Fed. I mean, right now you're starting to see models have maybe some potential market cuts next year probably about july is what i just saw this morning it gets updated every week right but it looks like yes yeah, so that can change by the way <laughs> but it looks like that we're now starting to see that the markets are saying the fed's probably going to have to do some cutting next year so I, I don't know what are your thoughts right now where the fed is they, they're in a tight corner i think if they push too much further especially going to november i think they can reverse sentiment so fast that that, that changes the retail that changes capex that changes a lot of things and that and that gets back into to what we talked about last time, the hard landing, soft landing. Yeah, and that's why I'm still personal, not, not the firm view, my personal view is we're headed more likely for a hard landing. At some point, this is gonna bite, there'll be a tipping yeah. point, and then all of a sudden- I wish I could fight you on that one, but I, I, I agree with you. <laughs> um, but then, you know, when it hits, there will be a you know, very strong, very quick reaction from the Federal Reserve probably and Washington as well. But you know what, one of the things is once sentiment's destroyed, despite their actions, the reversals and, and decision making, that's not gonna grab and change the sentiment. It takes a while for that sentiment to change. It, it, it that's why it's so important that they get it right beforehand, but the track record you and I know, they're yeah. not very good at doing that. So probably back to what you said earlier, and I think the best thing is, this is why you should have a financial plan helping you make the investment-based decisions because we know what's coming, what potentially is coming, and that's the only way to really sit this out and kind of somewhat be with less stress is to have that financial plan. Any Absolutely. any parting thoughts? No, I I will echo that again. And in each meeting, I am emphasizing the financial plan first. Do we have the expenses correct? Yes. And then stress testing. What happens if we have this? And do the eyes light up or not? Or not? You want to have that conversation now, not not when, when things you are hear happening. About a broader war escalating. Yes. Yes. So use the time uh, time that we have, however long we, that is, use it wisely. And Kevin, as always, thanks for joining and lots of good information. And we'll be talking next month. Sounds good.